Welcome back. Let's pick up where we left off with the last video and continue on with part two of a tour of FormZ Pro's interface. Now let's look at the main modeling tools. Here on the left, we have two columns with multiple rows in each column. And under each one of these modeling tools are additional tools. And those are displayed with this flyout menu. And so if I hover over each one of these, you'll see there are several other tools to choose from that I can then hover over and select and choose a different tool from that category. Every one of these has quite a few tools underneath it. And these are all what are called tear off palettes. So if you hover over and then you hover over the main title of that section, you can actually tear it off and it will stay on the screen. You can then close it if you wanna get rid of it, but you can hover over and pull as many of these off as you want to, depending on maybe the set of tools that you wanna work with for that time being. And then when you're done with them, you can close them because you know where to find them. On the right side of the screen, we have several palettes that are on by default. We have tool options, which no matter which tool I choose, I get a different set of options. So not only are there a lot of tools to choose from, but there are many things you can do with those tools once you have them selected. And these are things that sometimes you wanna set ahead of usage and sometimes you can change things after you use a tool. We'll get into all that in this video series. The next palette that's on by default is materials, and we have several colors to choose from, but this is the place where anything lives where we may wanna change the appearance of an object. Next, we actually have our object list. And so this is one way to organize a project is by object. This is where we can control the visibility of objects independently of one another. We can group objects together. We can lock objects. We can select objects. There's many things we can do with this palette. Then we have our layers palette, which is another one that's open by default, where we can organize our project into layers. Layers allow us to put multiple objects on a single layer and then control similar functions as we can with the objects, but it will apply it to all of them in that layer. So right now, everything is on layer one. If I create a new layer, and I'm going to make that layer active, and I'm going to draw another object now, and this object was drawn on layer two. So if I turn the visibility of layer one off, you can see here that I can actually hide everything on layer one and layer two stays visible. If I make layer one active, I can turn off layer two. And so it's a good way to control visibility of objects, but also organize our project. The next one that's open by default are our lights and our lights are very necessary when it comes to rendering our scene. And we'll be getting into that palette quite heavily in another video. The last palette that's open by default is the Views palette. And like most of these palettes, we will have a dedicated video just for this palette, but this allows us to save different view angles of our project and jump to those very easily. At the bottom of the modeling window, we have our reference plane tools, which allow us to change the orientation of the reference plane. So the default is the XY plane. Another option is the YZ orientation. And the last option is the ZX orientation. And these are nice, quick shortcuts. And of course, we can move that reference plane around wherever we need it to be when we're modeling objects. These are just some quick shortcuts to get to some basic ones. The next section down here are our grid settings. And the default setting for the reference plane grid here is 10 feet between major delineations with five subdivisions. You can change those numbers around and make the grid as small or as large as you would like. And again, you can always turn that reference plane visibility on and off completely up here at the very top of the screen. The next set of tools allow us to modify the reference plane in a much more customizable fashion. So rather than these basic defaults that are over here, what we can do is we can click on these tools and we can actually hover over a face in our model and snap the reference plane right to that face. So I can click on any one of these faces to move the reference plane around. And it's a little hard to see with this display style, so let me switch that display style so you can now see that grid. And if I click around on these different faces, you can see the reference plane is actually moving and snapping right to the face of the object wherever I may need it. That comes in handy when you wanna build on top of something. So for example, I'll build a little cylinder on top of this as if it were a tower. And you can see I'm now building right on top of that object. And by moving the reference plane there, it allowed me to do that. So I can click on this button, define a new location for my reference plane, and then draw right on top of it. 
The next button allows us to modify our reference plane, either grow it or shrink it or rotate it. And when we click on that, we get these handles and I can drag and extend my reference plane in any one of the cardinal directions. Or I can click on one of these rotation handles and manually rotate it around any one of the major axes. Lastly here, I have the ability to lock the reference plane. So normally when you're drawing, if that is not locked, you can see that the reference plane jumps around onto the various faces of objects, and it allows me to just draw right onto an object very quickly, but sometimes that is not advantageous. Sometimes you want to actually lock it in place so that it doesn't do that, and that's what this next button here does. Now when I hover over any of these faces of the objects, I can actually only draw on the main reference plane. The next section is our grid snaps, and if I click on grid snap, you can see we can turn that on or off right there, and we can set the increment at which we're snapping to. By default, we're snapping at every one foot module, so if I go to a rectangle and I click on my grid, you can see here it is snapping to every one foot module. If I turn that off, I'm pretty free form to do whatever I want. Of course, you can change that number and make it whatever you want, so let's go with four feet, and now it will snap every four feet from my first point of clicking on the reference plane. That goes for X, Y, and Z coordinates. The other thing you can do with these grid controls is right click and go to your snap options. And this pulls up a separate palette that you have a lot more control over everything that's going on. We can change a lot of additional things in here. For example, we could match the grid module. We can change the guide snap degree. We can change all kinds of additional things like tolerances, snapping to ghosted objects, sticking to edges, etc. So that's a good little hidden menu to know about. The last series of buttons I'm going to talk about here in the FormZ modeling interface are object snaps. Object snaps allow us to be accurate when we're modeling by snapping to existing objects or other guides that happen to be on the screen to help us as modeling aids. And you can turn on and off various snaps depending on what you need as you're moving along through the project. We have the ability to turn off all object snaps completely or we can choose a series of combinations of any of these snaps. So for example, you could turn on endpoints, midpoints, and intersections, and you could turn off the rest, and you can have any combination that you would like. So this is worth getting used to because there's a lot of different kinds. For example, perpendicular or tangents or center of faces. One of my favorites is actually this snap to interval. And what an interval is, if I zoom in onto my model here, if I go to draw a line, and I hover over a segment, you can see that it automatically subdivides that. And right now it's subdividing it into the midpoint. So I'm gonna turn off the midpoint snap, and you can see now that it's dividing it into thirds. And the reason it's doing that, if I go and right click and go into my snap options, one of the options here is an interval snap. So if I set this number to anything that I want, like five, and then hover over my line, you can see it's now divided into five segments. And that just takes the math out of it for me as the user, which is really handy. So if I wanted to divide any edge into fifths, that's a great way to do it. And now if I click on one of those and start drawing, I start drawing right there. And I can snap back to another fifth, for example. It's worth noting that when you're drawing in Form Z, and we'll get more into this in later video, but when you're drawing, you get these temporary guides that show up as aids while you're drawing. And you can see we get one in the X and Y because we're constrained to the reference plane when we're drawing. So we don't get a Z axis, we get X and Y guides. And we also get this angle guide, which is set by this number down here on our grid options. If I hold down the shift key when I start moving in a direction, it constrains the drawing to that angle, which is really nice because then I get this inference. So you can see here when I'm pulling out and I've constrained my line to the X axis and I pull my mouse down, I get this additional guide that's showing up and that is an inference. And I can infer by snapping to another part of a different object that I want those two lines to meet by clicking there. And then I can let go of the shift key and I'm free to go in any direction I want. Again, now I could go in the Y direction, either positive or negative, or I could go along my angle guide, which is set by this number here. So if I 
start going out this direction, hold down my shift key, again I get the inference guide and I can snap to a corner of this other geometry and then I could click over here to complete that. That's a really nice way to align geometry without knowing the exact distances that these already are. It makes it very easy to construct geometry. So holding down the shift key while you're drawing kind of helps with all of these additional modeling aids down here as well to understand when you're actually drawing your objects. And before concluding this initial tour of FormZ Pro, let's take a look at the Windows version and launch it to reassure you that it's exactly the same as the Mac version. When FormZ launches, we also get the very familiar splash screen here where we can open recent files, open files that are older than recent, we can import geometry, or we can begin a new project. Clicking on new project will bring us into the same interface that we saw on the Mac side, where we have the modeling window in the middle. We have the same pull down menus across the top of the screen with the same commands in them. The only difference you may see in here are some of the various keyboard shortcuts where we have control mapped instead of the command key on the Mac. And we also have the same tool palettes surrounding the main modeling window. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to get notified when new videos are released on this channel, click the subscribe button below and click the notification bell icon to get a notification when new videos are released. See you in the next one.